Welcome to Band Geek. I'm Richie Castellano. Joining me today is my co-host Jarrett Pressman. Oh, hello. And uh, this is a an episode idea that some of the listeners or viewers, I guess, at this point, asked me to do because uh, basically I'm tagging along to Anne Marie's new um, like way of life. <laughs> Anne Marie decided she goes, you know what? I'm going to go out and try to see as much live music as possible and i was like oh yeah me too so <laughs> which is surprising because you're a shut-in <laughs> yeah ex- exactly i basically make this show so i don't have to leave my house <laughs> and i could still you know be social somehow but um yeah so i thought that was like a really cool you know new way of thinking from her so i said you know what i want to try to do that too and uh and what really kicked this off for me was uh paul mccartney um no uh, paul mccartney was actually the first show i ever seen um Let me back this up a little bit because I'm jumping in a little too fast. Um, This episode is about live shows. And uh, I know on Band Geek we do a lot of performances and we like to play the music ourselves. But we're also fans. And I know most of our fanboy stuff is about, you know, comic books and movies and and stuff like that. But, you know, we're we're music fans. Mm -hmm. So um, we definitely got to check out a lot of music lately. And I've been posting pictures on Facebook and Instagram and some of the band geek followers were just like, hey, why don't you do a concert review ep- episode? And they were talking about just doing one particular concert. But since we've been going to quite a few, I figure this it's a nice idea to sort of combine everything into one. Sure. Uh, so before we get started, if you would like to support band geek and you want to keep seeing us do cool and interesting things and funny things and goofy things, go to our tip jar. That's richiecastellano.com slash tip jar. And uh, you just, you know, it's a PayPal form and you leave whatever you can. And uh, last week we had a very successful charity drive yes. for um, disaster victims. Thank you very much yeah, for so all So we that. really appreciate you guys participating in the live stream. And we raised a nice chunk of money to help people who need it. So you guys rock. So thank you. And if you shop on Amazon, go to riotcast.com slash bandgeek. Hit the Amazon banner at the top of the page. And then you do your Amazon shopping like normal, except when you check out, a small percentage of your purchase goes to supporting our show, and it doesn't cost you anything extra, and it's a beautiful thing. So uh, It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> uh, I think before we actually jump into it, um, you and I did some purchasing this week, or this month, or whatever. Uh, yeah. You want, uh, you want me to go first, or you want to go first? You go first, because mine's over there, so I have to get it. Okay, I bought... Um, actually, I think this is the first... Fender Strat I ever owned. I don't think I ever had a Fender Strat before, and it was sort of like a. Uh, and here's here it is in full frame. Oh. Uh, you know, it's sort of like one of the meat and potatoes guitars that uh, people guitar players are supposed to have in their arsenal. I always had Strat like guitars. Like uh, back there, you could see there. That is my uh, Music Man Luke, and that's sort of Stratty. But I wanted like a straight up three single coil Strat, uh, and. My first, like, real Fender guitar that I bought... Actually, no, that's not true. I did have a Strat. I'm lying. I had a Strat. My grandfather gave me a Strat. Uh, <laughs> I just like that you're trying to get me to qualify. Like, uh, uh sure. Yeah, why not? This is a, this is a Strat. This no, is a, no, but I just, like... I, okay. It's black and white and it has strings. That's that's the... Uh, Non-guitar the players. You're going to hear terms like Strat and Telly and Les Paul. This is a Strat. <laughs> a Strat has this body shape. It usually has three pickups. One, two, three... And, um, you know, it's the kind of guitar that Jimi Hendrix and Steve Ray Vaughan played. Uh, those, are the, those are the big ones. And Richie Blackmore and David Gilmore and many, many others. Um, and more. Yeah, I actually, I, I did have a Strat and I didn't like it. I don't remember that. Yeah, I actually sold it. All right. And, um, and Maybe my, one of you bought it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I got, I, I sort of missed having one. So I got this one. And um, that telly over there on the wall... That is a Mexican Road War and Telly. Uh, I always wanted a Telly. Uh, I had one when I was a little kid, and my dad sold it because he's ruthless. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> because it was his guitar, <laughs> he could do whatever he wants with it. But um, I always, I always wanted another Telecaster with that kind of neck, and I, f- I got that. That's like a Mexican Road War and Telly, and I got Rocco Monterosso, who's been on Band Geek before, to shave the neck to make it sort of like what I remembered my old Telly being like, and that thing's awesome, and I was so impressed by that one, I wanted to get another Road Worn Series uh, Strat, and that's what it's, this is. It's not actually old and beat up and decrepit, it's it's made to look like that. Uh, and while Jarrett gets his thing that he bought, I'll play a little demo on it. I'm noticing, too, here, the little, the little line six wireless unit in yeah. here. Mm-hmm. 
my, my radio unit. Your radio unit. Um, yeah. When I'm actually, this is. Uh, I guess I never talked about this. Um, I got this cool Relay G10 from Line Six, and it's very cool to have in the studio. And it really, it really gets rid of all the maki mak. Uh, <laughs> were, were you just setting me up to say maki mak? Maki mak. Yeah. So this is what it sounds like. Um, <laughs> My lights are a little buzzy right now, you have to forgive me. And uh, here's the middle position. Neck and middle. <laughs> the, uh, let, me, let me get my Steve Luke at the sound. I keep forgetting we're not in love anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my neck pick up here. <laughs> You know what's funny? I play the neck pickup and I immediately change back because I'm like a stupid guitar player. But anyway. And uh, for those of you who are interested, which is probably like four of you, uh, these are DiMarzio pickups. There, it's DiMarzio Virtual Solo and DiMarzio Area 61s. So that's my little show and tell thing. I like it. Oh, here's some cheese with it. And I'm plugging into the Helix right now. <laughs> everything but okay anyway there it is and you bought yourself a toy as well right i did uh i have an unlicensed nuclear accelerator uh yeah why don't you put it in the frame there guy there we go oh look oh look. there we go this way uh this is uh believe it or not this is from the uh spirit of halloween uh stores the halloween stores that they put up all over the uh country this time of year um this is their, like, adult, like, pack replica, like, their high-end pack replica. This was only 80 bucks. this, uh, but I got it for 50 because I got lots of coupons online. Um, uh, as you can see here... If you can see, Jared's a big Ghostbusters fan. Ah, uh, look at that guy. And the pack he's wearing here is obscured by the rest of his body, <laughs> but, um... Because the pack that I'm wearing in that photo is actually for a child. It's my actual Kenner Proton pack from when I was a kid. I just uh, put straps on it for an adult, but you can see the Kenner trap there as well. <laughs> um, and I've been wanting to upgrade for a while, but uh, like Richie with the lightsabers, like you could go to Toys R Us and buy a Force FX lightsaber, and it might be like eighty bucks. Um, if you want a like a, a heavy duty, like uh, real good looking lightsaber, you know you're gonna spend three, four, five hundred dollars on it. Same thing with proton packs. People sell these and make these professionally. For like four, five, six hundred, even like a thousand dollars, with all like working electronics and rumble motors and stuff. Um, but well, this... I want to, I want to just back you up for a second. This might seem like silly to you guys, because it is. It is. But you got to understand something, Jarrett. I've known him for a very long time. He's been obsessing about having a proton pack for as long as I've known him. <laughs> so this is a big deal. And you know what? We're we're band geek. So we're sharing this today. Yes, this is the ba band. Yeah, <laughs> geek. That's how it works. <laughs> um. But no, I, I got it yesterday. It's it's very cool. Um, it's it's hard plastic. The the expensive ones are made of like fiberglass and resin and and a lot of electronics inside. Um, but for I got it for fifty bucks, and you really can't pass this up. I am gonna upgrade it at some point too. But it also has uh, some electronics in it. I'll show the business as well. There we go. See that? I'm flashing there and there and there. So it's just on or off? It is just on. I mean, if you leave it on, it will eventually, it does eventually just, you know, cycle through and does like a little power down sound. Okay. After like a minute and a half. Um, but you can... But I'm very excited about this. Um, it I, looks... It, it, you know what? I couldn't tell it was plastic different. until I picked it up. It was very light. It's... Uh, and you can see here. I'll put it a little bit closer. 
looks really good. They put stickers and like the they painted it to look like it's metal and a little weathered and stuff. Um, but yeah, and it's three AA batteries, and I think it's about like eighty percent the size of like what a full pack would be. So, if you have kids or you want a starter pack, um, like me, um, Spirit of Halloween stores, dude. They're all nice gifts. Very cool. If you'd like to sing us, see us sing the Ghostbusters theme, you can go back to episode. Oh, now I gotta put the thing up uh, here. Oh, right there. It's gonna there. be here. There. I I can't get my I'm the scarecrow from the Wizard of Oz. Um, so but, yes, you can go back and watch that as well as many other spooky Halloween videos. That's right. In October. Uh, okay, so now let's get to the. Now we did our little. <laughs> We've dispensed with the pleasantries, Commander. <laughs> okay, so concert season for for us. The first concert I ever saw was when I was 13 years old. Uh, I think it was at, I want to say like maybe Giant Stadium um, or Brendan Byrne Arena. <laughs> and it was Paul McCartney. Uh, as a kid, I was a massive Beatles fan, and it was a huge deal for me. And my wife, Anne Reed, never seen Paul McCartney. And, you know, it, it, she says, Paul's coming. I really want to see him. I never saw him. I don't know if he's going to do another tour after this, you know. So I... Did what every concert goer does. I called my credit card company and tried to get good seats, and that didn't work out too well. So I ended up going, still paying top dollar, and getting to sit in the nosebleed section. So still, you're still there, and yeah. some people weren't. So um, this is uh, this is where we were we were sitting for for McCartney. Um, it's it's hard to. This is in uh, Prudential Center. It uh, but it's it's like hard to tell because like uh, the. the if you go to a concert and you try and videotape it, you always actually seem farther away than you actually are. I, I felt pretty far away here, though, <laughs> to be honest. But, uh, but uh, no, I mean, you can see you're on, the, like, the second mezzanine there. I think this... I, I don't want to get copyright flagged, so I don't want to play uh, any music on this one. Yeah. Uh, but And also, I don't think it's cool to, like, p play clips of our bootleg <laughs> shows here. But um, this is... Uh, oh, look at... Check this out. This this is... I think this was during... Uh, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, and I think there was a one one part part where they had, like sh had lasers going. Oh, there it is, like laser beam, freaking laser beams going out to the entire audience. That's so cool. Yeah. So um, McCartney. So let's talk a little bit about that show. Um, okay, the band is a little different than the first time I saw McCartney. Uh, he had uh, I saw McCartney for the first time 1993 on the Off the Ground tour. Okay. And his band is almost completely different, with the exception of the keyboard player. Keyboard player is the same as uh, Wicks Wickens, they call the guy. <laughs> and um, so I guess I'll start from him. The, this guy nailed everything. Like, n and not not only just like the performances, but just like even like the sounds. Right. You know what I mean, like it almost sounded like. And if anybody knows the deal with this, like please let me know. I'd like to read up on it. But it almost sounds like he had access to the original recordings, which I'm sure he does. Sure. Like being in Paul McCartney's band, and he you know, used samples from the original sessions. Cause, so when he would play, like, a French horn from, like, you know, uh, like a psychedelic Beatles tune, sure. like, it sounded like the right sound every time. Not just like, oh, he's using a French horn sound. It's not like, wait, he sounds like he's playing the sample from the record. It was crazy. And the guy was just spot on, and there were parts, like, when they did um, Eleanor Rigby, the guy played, like, the whole string quartet on his keyboard. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that they do. I'd be, I'd be, yeah, I'd be actually yeah. interested to learn how that works, too. Yeah, and, and um, his guitar players, uh, Rusty and, or Dusty, I don't remember his name, but uh, Busty. No, his, <laughs> <laughs> Rusty, his, Dusty, and Busty. Yeah. Um, his, those, those are the scraps names of Scrooge McNuck's nephews. <laughs> <laughs> no, those are, those are his, his, uh, nieces. his nieces. His stripper nieces. <laughs> Rusty, Dusty, and Busty. Oh, man. <laughs> so um, his guitar players were ridiculous. One guy doubles on bass. Uh, probably some of the most, like, fantastic, like, vintage -y guitar sounds I ever heard. You know, like, when I went to go see, like, um, a couple summers ago when BOC opened for Dream Theater, mm -hmm. that was probably the best, like, hard rock metal sound I ever heard. But in terms of like, you know, vintagey mid gain, you know, like single coil right. uh, type of, like single coil. Yeah. Um like those type of tones, yeah. like McCartney his guitar players were phenomenal. Um and uh the oh the drum I gotta mention the drummer, uh, Abe Laboreal Jr., who not only like played his butt off, but he also sang okay. most of the gig. 
uh, even like doubling Paul a lot of the times, like in all the choruses. So I was very, very impressed by that show. Um, you know, and also uh, an interesting, an interesting thing happened is just, it's just that like the older we get, the harder it is to sing high. And Paul McCartney has a very high tenor voice. Unless you're Tommy Shaw. Yeah. <laughs> then you just get better. Or, or Mickey Thomas, which we'll get to. <laughs> um, but, you know, McCartney's voice maybe isn't what it was 20, 30 years ago. Sure. But what this actually facilitated was that he did different tunes than what you would be used to hearing. Okay. I see. Um, so, for example, like, he did uh, something, the George Harrison tune, which is... You know, a tune that's kind of not too high. Right. And he did a beautiful version of it. And it's just a song that I never thought I'd hear him do because that's a George song. And then he did um, I Want to Be Your Man, uh -huh. a Ringo tune. Okay. And that was great. And he did, did like I mentioned before, one of my favorite Beatles, uh, like uh, Lennon tunes, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. And my mind was blown. Like, I was like, I was having like a, a good time when I went to go see it, especially considering where the seats were. Sure. But like, as soon as I saw like... Mr. Kite and the and the fact that his production got went from just being like just a stage to filling up the whole arena. Right. Like that's when you realize, okay, this guy knows how to do an arena show. You know, and that that really was was great. And I had a very positive even despite the the seats being kind of crappy, I had like a very positive concert experience with it's, that. It's funny that you mentioned that he because his voice is changing and he can't quite do what he used to do, yeah. that like he adjusts for it, versus the videos that uh, Vin Innocente sent me uh, when he saw Barry Manilow like a month ago. And I, you know, I, I, I don't, it's not a joke. Like, I legitimately love Barry Manilow. I was raised he on does, Barry Manilow. He does. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a very deep association uh, with my mom, but um, he sent me video and Barry Manilow the past couple of years when he does the songs that he can't really do that well. He does that kind of cop-out where it's like, you sing this verse. And the audience has a good time with it, but it's like, it's he's, did it, he's doing it a lot more Well, let me, I, I, I can speak to like that. five years ago. Because um, Eric wasn't feeling well and, and missed a couple of gigs okay. uh, last week, and I had to sing like four Eric tunes. And it's very hard. Uh, and I had a, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm a relatively young guy, um, and what song was it that we were doing? Oh, uh, Lips in the Hills, okay. right? Like, uh, there's a part in Lips in the Hills that goes like... <laughs> Maybe four or five times. Like by the end of the song, I went like the night that I saw, the night that I saw, the night that I saw, the night that I saw. Lips in the hills. So that you know that it's just it takes a certain amount of training, right, and stamina to do that. And even like I, I think of myself as an okay singer, but like doing that kind of intense singing, like Eric Bloom singing or Paul McCartney singing, where it's like up here, sure. For it, it's you know. It takes a lot of training, and eventually you can either do what Barry Manilow did, is right. just say, like, you do it, or what McCartney would do, which is say, screw it, I'm just going to sing these notes, and they're going to come out the way they're going to come out. Right. And I'm not saying, look, Paul McCartney is my hero of heroes, so I'm say, like, he was great. He did the songs better than I could ever dream of doing them. Uh, it's just, you know, it, it sounds different, because he's, he's an older guy. Right. Um, but it was still amazing. Um, so, so you can do that, you can do the audience thing. Or you can do like what Freddie Mercury would do, um, um, in, instead of like going for the high note, you duck it, you go for a lower note. So it's like, um, 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 I can't remember what he did. Oh, you went, um, 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 goodbye everybody. You know, he would just, right. you know, uh, just change the melody. And, like, a master of doing that, uh, who actually does it and makes it even more interesting, the original stuff, is Paul Rogers. Yeah. Uh, we've done quite a few gigs uh, opening for Paul Rogers, and he puts on a clinic of doing that sort of thing. And me, personally, like, I get it. As, as a singer, I'm like, yeah, you, especially, like, a guy singer, having to do all those high notes all the time, it's like, you, you can't. You'll, you It's like... 
at, at one point, your voice is going to crap out on you. Right. Unless you're super disciplined, which I get the, the sense that guys like Tommy Shaw and Paul Rogers and Mickey Thomas are super disciplined. Right. But, like, even, like, when Mickey Thomas would change stuff, it was always cool. Like, as long as you make it cool. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's also, but it's also the thing, like, you should be lucky enough, like, as a musician, that you're still going to be able to sing your tunes 40 years later and have to adjust to it, you know? Yeah, like, and you know what, if, <laughs> if... You don't think about that when you're writing it. It's like, oh, this is what I can sing. You're not going to be like, well, I'm not going to be able to sing this in 35 years when I'm still playing, you know, uh, arena shows or right. whatever. But, like, the thing is, it's also about the tunes, you know, because, uh, like, even if Paul McCartney couldn't make a single note, I would, I'm going to go see Paul McCartney. He's right. my hero. You know, he's like, I, 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 I idolize the guy. No, I get it. So I get it. Um, so that was the first concert I saw in a series of many. Um, and the next one was the Star Wars one, I think. Yeah, which, uh, I mean, he did pretty much a full episode of yeah, that. Yeah, if you want to uh, hear about that, again, go here. I'll put a link to it. Um, but you know what? I didn't really talk about the actual concert. Itself. It was always... I did all the before concert stuff. Um, that was ridiculous. Um, the New York Philharmonic is so good uh, that it was actually problematic that there was a movie screen there. Because you'd, I'd, I'd be watching Empire Strikes Back, which is a movie I've probably seen several hundred times. Right. And get lost in it because their like musical cues were so on point and perfectly mixed and balanced and perfectly executed that I didn't know. I, I kept remind, having to remind myself this is live. Yeah. There are guys. There's a guy you know on stage playing that like suspended cymbal part. Yeah. You know that's not. It, it's it was so good. It almost sounded fake. But like it's not fake because you see everybody playing it. You yeah. know. The uh, the same thing happened when uh, I saw the Back to the Future thing, and mm-hmm. also our bud Susie uh, Cider also yeah. conducts all those video game mm-hmm. ones too. It's if you have a chance to see that wherever you are in the country, chances are your local Philharmonic. Or your oh local yeah, we orchestra. were just in, in Ka- Kalamazoo with BOC, uh-huh. and the, the that Star Wars tour was the first stop of the tour, I think. Yeah, and yeah, so you, you should definitely check that out. They're so cool to go see, and it's just it's, it's you don't realize how much music like melds things together. Mm-hmm. You know, and that, that so much goes into it. You know, they have a, f- a full orchestra. Yeah, this was crazy. Um, and I was I was able to see the conductor, and the way they do it is he has a screen in front of him with, with a stripe, um, with bar lines. So like when the screen, when the, I think when the stripe hits, someone correct me if I'm wrong. You guys always do. <laughs> um, when the, when the stripe hits the end of the screen, let's see, here's a, so when it smacks Jarrett in the face, nah. psh, that's like he knows that's his cue. So he's like watching that the whole time and just like hitting events. And no hard it is to get like, you know, what is it, 100 pieces or, or so, or yeah. however many people's pieces of the orchestra it is, um, to like hit this note when the Imperial Walker hits the ground. It's right. like ridiculous. And and these guys were doing it. And if you, you, know, if you got to see it, good for you. Um, if it's, if any sort of like orchestral thing that you're into, like, because I, I understand classical music can be sort of, um, hard to, to digest for a lot of people, yeah. and they're not into it. But I feel like th- these sort of film and like pop culture shows they do are like outreach shows, and people who go have such a wonderful time yeah. at seeing the orchestra. Like you know, I want to go again. And you know, there are a lo- there are lots of shows. Like for example, um, Anne-Marie does a show uh, where she sings the music of Prince with an orchestra, right. and like these are these are cool things. I mean, yeah, it's not. You're not playing Mozart, you know. You're not playing Beethoven, but yeah. But I think that I feel like that's subjective. I feel like you're being, you know, uh, a classist. It's just like, oh, it's not classical music. No, but I'm saying but like it's... you, you might not be into that, but you could still go see an orchestra and have a great time. Like there's a Game of Thrones tour going around. Uh, I think there was a Harry Potter tour. Yeah, that still goes around. The, the music of the Legend of Zelda and uh, yeah, it's just it's yeah, yeah, video game Pokemon um, and countless tributes. Like there's a I, I did a Queen one. Um, you know, Amory does a there's a, a Prince one. That company does a Whitney Houston one. Yeah. a David Bowie one. Um, yeah, just a, a bunch of them. So uh, if you on Michael Jackson, so check that out if that comes to you. If it comes to a a theater near you. <laughs> Uh, and then the next one I think I saw was um, right after, the, the night after, I went to go see ARW. And this is the one that people were actually asking me to do a, uh, a review of um, on, on this show. And here's, here's what it looked like. And um, I'm muting it so you won't be able to hear me screaming. There's, there's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amory was like, you got to stop. Uh, there's Rick Wakeman wearing a cape. 
and uh, what he wore to sleep under the cape. <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't know if you show. It's great. Like th- that's the greatest outfit ever. Basically, you can just like roll off the bus. You don't have to change. You know, and he already has epic majestic hair, and you just put that <laughs> that cape on, and you're good to go. Uh, there's the oh, there's my best hero. There's my favorite guitar player, Trevor Rabin. Uh, melted my face. It was it was amazing. Um, John Anderson in the middle, of course. And the other two guys on the bass there is a guy named Lee Pomeroy, who's an English bassist who played with Steve Hackett. And on drums is a guy named Lou Molino, who I heard on Trevor Rabin's solo album, Jacaranda. And let me tell you, this concert was one of the best times I've ever seen these guys. And um, Who was the drummer? Did you just say who was Lou, the Molino Lou Molino is his name. And this guy was amazing. It, 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 okay. I got really emotional at this show. Um, <laughs> Why is that? It's okay. Here's the thing. I'm such a huge classic Yes fan. Like I love Fragile, Close to the Edge, Tales of Topographic Oceans, Going for the One, uh, um, uh, Relayer. You know, all, all all those classic albums. Yeah. The Yes album. Um, but I also love the Trevor Rabin era. I love Nine Hundred One Two Five, Big Generator. Yep. Um, I love. Talk. Talk is my favorite album of all time. That's like my number one favorite album. And Trevor Rabin is just a guy I admire because of like, you know, he does not only, not only is he the producer on these records, he's playing piano, he's playing guitar, he's writing the tunes. And then when he gets bored of touring and being a badass, he writes film scores for Jerry Bruckheimer. Right. You know, epic, majestic. He's just, ep- this is just majesticness. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, you know, I really admire him, but. Just to be able to see Trevor Rabin on stage with Rick Wakeman and then see Rick Wakeman playing, like, the more recent Yes tunes, yeah. that blew my mind. Like, Rick Wakeman, and it's on Anne Marie's Instagram if you see that, Rick Wakeman did this, like, crazy Moog solo during The Rhythm of Love, which is a very 80s, like, to the rhythm. Let's see if I can play it. Um, uh, uh. <laughs> I can't play it and sing it. Anyway, I have to learn it first. <laughs> but anyway, um, it's like a you know a good like good old rock, like eighties rocker. Right. But then there was this like ripping Moog solo at the end of it, totally out of place, totally inappropriate, totally perfect and amazing in every way. It was just it was that kind of show. And then like they did like changes. Um, you know. Yeah. songs on Band Geek now. <laughs> Crap. No, you don't. You know what the problem is? You go, the problem is we, we, I, you go to a concert yeah. and you go, I want to do this song on Band Geek. I want to do this song on Band Geek. I do, and then you do the next song on Band Geek and you're like, I don't want to do any songs on Band Geek. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just to see like, the funniest thing, you know, because I've, I've gotten the opportunity to play changes with Alan White on stage mm-hmm. and I'm sweating bullets playing because it's a hard tune. But watching Rick Wakeman play changes, he's just like sitting there like this. This is cute. <laughs> It's, yeah, I, I guess I, I guess some would consider this to be difficult. You know, he's just playing. It was it was nuts. Um, but and one of the other cool things was the type of set list they did, because you'd get to hear "Heart of the Sunrise" and watch, you know, Rick Wakeman play the perfect original part, right. and then hear Trevor Rabin do this like crazy, like modern rock, like awesome, like delayed, like heavy gain sort of thing. Right. It, it was just, like, crazy. And another interesting thing is that um, he he wouldn't, like, play the Steve Howe parts. Okay. Because I guess there is another... I don't know if that's intentional, like, with respect to Steve Howe, but I thought it was cool because you can go see Steve... Uh, yes, to Steve Howe. Um, and also, one thing I got to mention really quickly, um, I, uh, I want to send my uh, condolences to Steve Howe's family. Uh, his son Virgil passed away, and I actually met Virgil, and that's a good story. I think I should tell. 
I was on a flight from, I guess, L.A. to New York, and I'm reading Game of Thrones. And um, I'm reading it, and I'm in the window seat. And when I get on a plane, um, I want to sleep. Right. Uh, because a lot of times when you're touring, that's the only time you get to sleep is on the plane. So like, sleep is sort of paramount to me, so I don't, I try not to chat anybody up. I try to just like do something that's going to make me fall asleep, like right. l- listen to um, the soundtrack to the film we watched today, because that seemed to put me to sleep. Uh, yeah. We watched Blade, Blade Runner 2049 today. I didn't like it. But anyway. Um, <laughs> that's the soundtrack to Blade Runner. Yeah. Or, or read a book or do like a crossword puzzle, something, <laughs> something that's going to make me fall asleep. Sure. Um, so I'm reading Game of Thrones, and the guy next to me takes out his book, and he's reading Game of Thrones, and we look at each other. And, and he goes, you got good taste there, mate. And, I'm like, and, we, and we start talking, and, and he's got long hair, and he's with another guy with a leather jacket. And I'm like, uh, you guys musicians? And yeah, and then we, we start chatting, and um, and he goes, yeah, I'm in a band called Little Barry, and, and he, they had, both had English accents. Mm. And we're talking about like what they, we listened to growing up and everything. It's just like a cool, a fun conversation to have. And I said, oh, forget it. When I, was, when I was a teenager, I said I had like a stack of Yes VHSs, and I would just try to like learn everything off of them. And the other guy, um, the guy Barry, he reached, looked over and goes, do you know you're sitting next to Steve Isle's son? <laughs> I'm like, what? You're Steve Isle's son? And the guy's like, yeah. yeah. And then I was like, <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, he told me, I said, you know, where are you playing in Manhattan? I'll come see you. And I went to go see them. At, I can't remember what club it was. It was like the basement of some club. And they're like this sort of like punky blues rock sort of like awesome raw okay. like just rock and roll band you know and he was the drummer and he he kicked and they were great and I really liked them and I got to talk to him a, a little bit at the gig um, and then uh, that was really the last time I ever saw him I, I kept in touch with him on like Facebook and, and his band right. um, but yeah so I was very sad to hear that he his, his of his sudden passing so uh, you know my condolences uh, very sad to hear. Uh, but back to what I was saying originally, you know, there are two versions of the band. Right. Yes, there's Steve Howe's version, uh, and there, uh, Steve Howe, Alan White, if he's if he's still, I'm not sure if he's playing anymore, uh, with Jeff Downs and Billy Sherwood and and John Davidson, uh, who I actually also got to play with. Okay. Um, John Davidson was one of, if I'm not mis- mistaken, was one of the contestants on the Queen Extravaganza. Oh, right, on right, right. Bass. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. wasn't singing. Uh, so I forgot about that. So there's that version, and you know that's you're gonna hear all the very authentic sort of Steve Howe parts because Steve Howe's on the stage. But then, like you know, when you go see, um, you know, Yes with uh, with Trevor, you hear, you're like, hey, wake up. <laughs> Instead of like hearing, you know. You know, it was all it was all very stylized towards Trevor's style, and he just killed, and he melted my face, and and I was like, there was one tune they did, I think they did that song "Hold On" from uh, 90125, like "Hold On, Oh Sunshine, Shine On." Right, right. He did this like solo that he just played like sixteenth note triplets for like a minute. It was like, right? And he's just going nuts. And I was sitting like this. And I grabbed Amory. And I'm like this. And I went, What's happening? I screamed it at the stage. And she's like, Chill, dude. Oh, man. It's amazing. And, um. (laughs) What is happening? Oh, they did, um. I don't understand. They did South Side of the Sky, which is another tune we did on Band Geek. They did, and. and Uh, Right. Oh uh, God damn it! Here, right, here, right here, there. Okay, I, I. That means I got to go back and watch this again and put them all in. I hate you. All right, that's it. I'll stop. <laughs> um, and they did. Uh, the the thing that blew my mind though is they did like like I mentioned before. My favorite album is Talk, which is sort of a uh, critically acclaimed album, but didn't sell well. Right. Um, they did. Um, I am waiting. Which is the most one of the most beautiful songs from that album, and it's a song that I played at my wedding. You know what I mean? It's um. Let me turn up the delay here. That's how that song is beautiful. Uh, they did that. Me and Amory were flipping out. 
that and also we got we got very good seats for that show. We were very fortunate to have them uh, like fourth row, and I got to like watch where their fingers were. Right. And John Anderson's voice was freaking like angelic and perfect. Rick Wakeman doesn't miss anything. He's like he's just like a machine. Um, but another thing worth mentioning is the other guys. Now, I guess I'm biased because. Uh, I am the other guy okay. in the band I play with. Sure. You know, and and like some guys were saying, oh, you know, without Chris Squire, like why bother? But look, Chris Squire, my favorite bass player, he's can't play in the band anymore. Right. And the guy they had, if you can't get Chris Squire, this is the guy you want to get. Uh, Lee Pomeroy put on a clinic. Like he, not only did he have... The sound, but he nailed the parts. And when there was room for his own personal style and improvisation, it wasn't. He wasn't just like a cover band thing, like what we try to do. You know what I mean? Like like me when I play a Yes song, I'm trying to play Chris Squire note for note. But what he was doing is he was just like elevating it to his own thing. Like he did this gorgeous solo in Heart of the Sunrise. That that's another thing. Like the amount of jamming going on. Yeah. Uh, like they were like looking at each other, talking to each other, and jamming, which I've never really seen Yes do. Like they'll do extended solos, but you know, like they're prearranged. But like, th- like they were on stage. Like, like Rick Wakeman and Trevor were just like having a conversation. Like, what are we gonna do next? Right. And like, you know, they would point to the bass player and say, "Go ahead," and he'd go to the front of the stage and play a solo. They did um in the middle of Owner of Only Heart. They did Sunshine of Your Love by uh, by Cream. Oh wow. Yeah, it it was just it was just insane, and. Uh, and also the drummer, uh, Lou Molino, like, just, you know, authoritative. I don't know if that's a word, but he was just like, you know, he no. he basically, like, wrangled the whole band, but without making it sound like that, which is a skill I love when drummers can do that. Like, they can basically, it just, they can make cues sound like they're part of the song instead of going like, okay, guys, one, two, three, four. He just had all these little fills that he would do. Right. Um, let me see if I have any other interesting pictures or, or videos I could show from, from this. I'm just going to scroll through my stuff here. All right, there's oh, there's him playing an acoustic guitar, and uh, I want you to notice my very st- steady camera work here. That's very nice. Um, I got some stills here. I think oh, here's a, here's a good high quality still. Look look at look at the majesty in this photo. You see this? You see the majestic expression <laughs> on his face? Look at that cape. You see? The, look at one point, Trevor played so fast he actually went on his side like this. Do you see that, Jared? <laughs> uh, <no. laughs> Um, also, he he seemed to have some sort of like modeling rig or something. At least that's what it sounded like. I don't know why this. Oh, that's his rig. I took a picture of it um, as they were packing down because you know I care about these sort of things. So that was it. If it's that's uh, the music of Yes or Yes featuring A R W. If you can go see that, I highly recommend it. Um, and then I got to cram in another little show, but I don't know if this counts. Because um, uh, Mickey Thomas's Starship yeah. was opening for BOC in Florida, and I stood on the side of the stage, and as everybody uh, in the audience was yelling at me while I was watching them, "Hey Richie," <laughs> that's okay. I don't mind. That's okay. Um, but I was just like in fanboy mode, not um, you know on stage mode, I guess. Right. But um, if you can go see Mickey Thomas's Starship, and that's another situation. There's two Starships, and they're both very good. Right. Um, like um, Jude Gold is the guitar player in. Um, the uh, Jefferson Starship version, right? And that guy's a monster player, uh, and a uh, very nice dude. If you can go see that band, and we've played with him several times, that guy smokes. He's great, and um, and David Friedberg is awesome. You know, just that that band's great. Uh, but I, I'm a huge Mickey Thomas fan. Right, I that, like Starship, Starship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've done several. I'm not gonna put links. But we've done several <laughs> Starship tunes with Mickey Thomas, um, and that guy hasn't lost anything. Yeah, and his band is also slamming. Uh, you know, I can't remember the, the the names of the guys in the band, but they were crazy. And they got a girl who s- sings the Grace Slick stuff. Mm. Awesome. But let me tell you, I squeed and and geeked out <laughs> watching watching Mickey Thomas sing. Dude, if you can if you can go see him, go see him because yeah. he he sings his ass off. It, it's it, he 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 hasn't lost anything. You, you know what I mean? Like, do you think he's Jay- got- Nah, he's just doing all those crazy freaking right. Oh, it was amazing. It was ridiculous. Do you think he's gotten better? Yeah, I, I I'd say that. I'd say he's gotten better. Sure, absolutely. It, it, like he because it just, I guess it, you have to get better if right. you're gonna keep singing like that. Sure, it, it was. It's nuts. If you can go see that, go see that. Um, and then um, I will get to the um, 
the grand finale of, <laughs> of today's uh, of today's shenanigans. Um, I'll let you take it from here, Jarrett. Me? As I do a little video overlay. Uh, Which one's a good one? Uh, you could do that. Yeah, that, just do that one. Okay. <laughs> That's not a good one. <laughs> it's just the weirdest one. Uh, uh, that looks great. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible. All shot on my new iPhone. Eight. Here we go. Yeah. Here we go. That looks good. Okay. okay. So take it. Uh, so this is the Katy Perry witness tour. That we we witnessed it. <laughs> um, this is uh, uh, we Richie and I went uh, a couple of days ago, and um, we are Katy Perry fans. We're Katy Cats. You are Katy Cats. You guys know this. Um, we did go to her last tour at this same location. This is the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, um, and it we. Thoroughly enjoyed the last concert. We are not huge fans of this new album she has, um, but we were afforded the opportunity to go to the uh, this new concert, and we were kind of disappointed. Um, all right, let's 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 go into it. Let's go into it. You're, you're, okay, first of all, <laughs> first first I gotta do a little a little PSA here. I, I wanted to let you vent. I didn't want to get. I want to let you do that. Okay. People still like me. <laughs> really? Well, I don't know. As, okay. far, as far as I know. <laughs> okay. We got to we got the opportunity um, to sit in a of uh, I've never actually done this before uh, to sit in a luxury box. I've I've never gone to a concert in a luxury box before. Uh, this is it. Um, it's basically like these uh, was it ten seats? The ten seats, and, that's and then it. behind those seats are. Lots of free food, uh, free drinks. It's well, a, not free if you pay for it. It's well, a, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a lounge. It's, yeah. a, it's your own personal lounge, and they go all around the stadium. You can see in the, when you look at that pic. Um, you know, and it's kind of like uh, right above like the orchestra level, I guess. I mean, everything is, is uh, it's set up a little different for any, any event that's there. But, I mean, you're pretty damn close. I mean... Right there, you can see there's maybe what, fifteen rows in front of us to the stage, and that's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. So for the people, first of all, okay. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know how to address this because this just, blew. So just no. Just, choking on my own rage. This just blew my mind. I I I put pictures up of hey, check it out. I'm going to a concert now. First of all, there's those of you who are mad at me for going to a Katy Perry concert. <laughs> Why? Why are you mad at me for going to a Katy Perry? Who cares? What do you, What do you care what I go see? But it's just like, how could someone who plays rock music go see Katy Perry? I'll tell you why. Because I saw McCartney. It was amazing. He does a great show. But this is an arena show. This is like going to see the Three Ring Circus. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, this is different. This is like almost like Cirque du Soleil plus rock concert, you know? The last time we went, when we went to the last tour, it ruined, like, it ruined you for concerts for a while. Oh, yeah. Because it's not, like, you guys go see BOC, which is great. You're going to see your favorite... Why you, gotta, why you gotta compare that? I'm talking to our fans. But you guys go see BOC or Foreigner or or Sticks or whoever, and, and they're playing their tunes and stuff like that, and there might be effects and video screens and stuff like that. But these, these concerts are like a full-out production. Yes, it's a different sort of thing. It's, if you haven't been to something like this, the thing I can recommend watching is the the documentary. This is it, the Michael Jackson documentary. Yeah, it's or the, the, it's, the Pink tour that that like did, did she, didn't she do like a circus theme tour? Yeah, it's just but just like it's that level of production goes into it with screens and and costumes and effects and floating around the audience and all this kind of stuff. But. Okay, so if you got a problem with me going to Katy Perry, that's I guess that's okay. <laughs> but here's the thing: like, if someone posts pictures of the seats, why would you say, "Ugh, you're in the nosebleeds"? <laughs> like, that's like saying, "Hey, Jared, look at my new car. It's a it's a Toyota Camry." Ugh, why aren't you driving a Mercedes Benz? Because I can't afford a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> my analogy was, "Hey, look, I got a seat on the first commercial flight to Neptune." Ugh, coach. <laughs> what are you sitting in coach for? So, I'm going to Neptune. <laughs> what what's wrong with you guys? Seriously, <laughs> who says that? Okay, I'm done. My rant, my rant is over. But anyway, so they were very good seats. Um, also ruined me for other concerts because I don't ever want to go where there's not food and leather chairs. Also, it and... was comfortable. There was no one next. To, it was basically me and you in that section by ourselves. There were other people there, but they were. Dip, I guess they didn't want to sit next to two men, <laughs> two grown men that weren't um, either. 
um, a, a couple or yeah. escorting young girls like as nieces or daughters to the concert. I'm thankful for the qualifier, uh, nieces and daughters. Yeah. They're just escorting young girls to this concert. So, yeah. I guess maybe they weren't comfortable sitting next to us, but maybe we... Maybe we <laughs> I mean, if, let's look at that picture again. Are we giving off a creepy vibe? Oh, yeah, we are. Oh, yeah, totally. No, I'm, wait, making, wait. I'm making the selfie look at this, face. Look, wait, look at this thing. Look What's going this? on over here? Oh, my God. What's going on in this area? That, okay. That? That's pretty creepy. This is like, you know, can't be near a park or, or like a public place for children. No, the thing you're pointing out there is the sweet end of 66 feet of intestines. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, I guess to, to back this up and to qualify this, we have to talk about the first time we saw Katy Perry. Right. Um... First time we saw Katy Perry, oh, you have to go back to your folder if you want to pick one of your, yeah, you got it. The first time we saw it was her third tour. Yeah, it was on the Prismatic World Tour. And we saw it at Barclays, but that time we definitely were in the nosebleed section. Right, but, but we were it just happy to be there. But the thing is, it doesn't matter because Katy Perry puts on such a huge concert that no matter where you're sitting in the place, there's something to see. Right. And... To be honest, if you're sitting right up front, you're missing a lot of that. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where you have to be back further to take it all in. I, I, when I used to go see a lot more musicals, mm -hmm. I never wanted to sit in the orchestra. I always wanted to sit in the first row mezzanine because they always had huge casts. Right. So you're you're like, yeah. I I'm not saying like don't go. Hey. I know, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, I'm not saying don't go to a concert and and sit in the front row if you can. That's awesome. You're cool. But I'm saying, like, for a big concert, it kind of, like this, you're kind of covered where, no matter where you are. Um, so, oh, you want to show something? <laughs> yeah, I okay. mean, look at this. This is how she arrived through a giant eyeball on the stage. Um, that's the ship that uh, 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 Jor-El sent Superman to Earth in. <laughs> you, you, you almost delivered that joke perfectly. Almost. <laughs> I couldn't get the name out. So, okay, the first concert we saw, she had her... I guess it was mostly, uh, correct me if I'm wrong again, as you guys always do, I guess it was mostly her same band from the Warp Tour, mm -hmm. which is, Katy Perry, for those of you who don't know, started as um, uh, a girl act on a punk tour, you know? Mm -hmm. And she had basically a rock or punk, I guess, rock band behind her. And we saw, I guess, the majority of that band right. last time. And the good thing about it is Katy Perry does pop tunes, and if you follow her progression, they get more and more electronic sounding, which is fine. But they had two, like, rock guitar players who would beef everything up, right? And they had, like, a drummer who rocked, who would beat, and, like, every, and everybody would just beef things up and make these, like, beef arrangements of everything. And it really pumped you up, right? You know, the production was great, but just the fact that, like, for example, in I Kissed a Girl, the first time we saw her, mm -hmm. she goes off stage to a costume change. The guitar players all of a sudden levitate. They're being suspended in the air by wires. They're playing guitar solos, right. like trading, and then all of a sudden, at the end of like a, we're talking like three, four minutes of guitar solo and then at a was, pop concert and then, harmony guitars. Yeah, then they do like maiden esque harmony guitars and flames start shooting out of their headstocks. Right? <laughs> I'm like, I feel like I'm watching a, an episode of Metalocalypse, you know, not a Katy Perry concert. And 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 they did that frequently. Like, yeah. They would do like breaks like that. So my problem is that she went from that. Now her new album basically has no rock elements on it anymore. It sounds like the same song from start to finish. She, it just basically, it's basically like electronic club music, I guess you would say. Right. Um, which, if you like it, that's fine. Personally, uh, it's I'm not crazy about the album. That's me personally. Um, but she basically... You want me to switch that? That's a, that's a, good, that's a good jam you picked there. <laughs> uh, she basically... Oh, hey, look at this. This is a great... This is I Kissed a Girl, and the person in the front, her her guitarist, is shredding for eight bars. Yeah, let's 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 be honest here. So they re that was my problem. They took this beefy sounding rock band and replaced them with a very clean sounding, very good. Right. No, they were they were awesome for what they were. Very playing. competent, very good, but sort of what you'd see other artists have. Right. Like, I thought the cool thing about Katy Perry, and, like, the cool thing about Pink is that she's got rockers behind her that are just laying it down and right. that can do the arena thing. You know what I mean? But basically, like, uh, what I thought they ended up doing was they t made all the old songs sound homogenous with the new songs. Right. So they were, the aesthetic they were going for was this, like, 80s synth pop 
thing and the whole stage looked like a trapper keeper. <laughs> it, looked, um, it looked like a trapper keeper had sex with Lisa Frank while the Saved by the Bell credits were playing in the background. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy that. See, do I have it? <laughs> it was just... Uh... Well, that's... Man, what, what good are you? What, what, what picture did you take? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, well, okay. Here's something. <laughs> yeah, so there's flamingos. There's all the 80s graphics on the screen. They had, like, Pac-Man pop up. Yeah. And, you know, the see, oh, the whole band is dressed like a, an 80s uh, tribute band. Yeah, that's Leah Thompson's character from Howard the Duck playing yeah. guitar on the left there. Um, from I, Cherry I, Bomb. And I believe over here the only uh, uh, player she kept is the bass player. And I think he's been with her for a long time. The story I remember hearing is that um, when she was just getting started and really didn't have a place to rehearse or whatever, um, that I believe that guy is the bass player from Hoobastank. Right. And and they let her rehearse at their rehearsal space. And, and so, you know, she's sort of returning the favor. Right. Um, uh, again, uh, things I heard, that could, they don't have to be true necessarily. Um, but that's what I really missed about it. Uh it was just that, like, when they would do the old tunes, they would do these new weird arrangements where you couldn't even recognize them. Right. Uh, and and I and they did that last time where they they changed them, but again, beefed up. Yeah. Like everything was heavier and, and beefed up. This time, everything was weirder and 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 lighter sounding and more electronic sounding, right. just to make it more cohesive with the new stuff. But I think that wasn't the right move because b basically everybody was like, "What song is this?" Yeah. And then like, <laughs> and and it, it almost like. Drew. She was like, "You know this song." It's like, "No, we don't." Yeah, it was just like, "What a, is it?" It was just, I'm, forgive me. It was like blue balls. It was just like you'd be like, "What?" <laughs> huh? You know, you you didn't. It, it just sapped the energy out of it. And I, and I felt that happened a few times. Like especially when there would be like an extended block of new tunes, where she'd just be like, "Okay, here we're gonna do this new stuff." And and look, Katy Perry's got more hits than uh, than any than like. She's got a crazy amount of hits. Right. She could have spaced them out. Like say, "Okay, new song, old song, new song, old song." But she decided to just be like, "Nope." Block of new tunes. Everybody was just like, whatever. But the the last time I saw her, the best part of the show was when the whole band stopped playing. She walks up to the front of the stage, to like the, this podium in the middle, right. and she plays um, an acoustic guitar. Do you have any of that? Uh, there's a. Uh, it's gonna be like right oh, here. There you go. So I. Oh, th this yeah, is back and forth. This is kind of nifty. She asked everybody to put their cell phone lights on, and it actually illuminated the whole freaking place. Yeah, it was actually it was pretty, nuts. It was cool. But so she, in the old tour, she came down and like right in the front and just sat there. Yeah. Here, I don't know if I actually have a like a great shot of it going, but she's sitting on like Saturn. Yeah. And it actually went around the entire arena. So this was actually the first time I saw her. This was my favorite part of the show because she. The band stopped playing. She just came out with an acoustic guitar, and she's great. Yeah. Like she's a like, yeah, she's a pop princess, but she's a singer songwriter. Yeah, and she just played her tunes by herself with her acoustic. Like, and you could tell because, uh, unlike oh, this thing's moving now. Okay, yeah. Also, oh, there's the uh, the the planet moving. Yeah, sorry for the light focusing. But unlike. The rest of the show, which is like done to a strict clock, where like there's video screens moving and there's lights moving in time and all this stuff happening, right. like all that stuff stopped. The lights got just kind of simple, and she just played some tunes. Like the show, like the the show time clock stopped while she could just do her thing, right? You know, and it wasn't so rigid. Um, and that was my favorite part. And the reason it was my favorite part is because um, you almost get bombarded. Like, it's sensory overload. She has video screens, she has dancers, she has giant props moving in and out of the stage. Everything had an eyeball. Everything has an eyeball. Uh, <laughs> Everything er had an eyeball. Actually. Everything has, like, a synchronized LED on it. Her her bra had, like, a synchronized LED on it. Oh, yeah, you, it. you saw a little bit of that yeah. in the other video we were uh, watching. Yeah. It was, it, it literally scrolled across with lyrics and graphics and, uh, yeah, there you go, there's a little bit of it. Yeah, and it was moving in time with the music. Right. Yeah, how crazy is that? Anyway, so that was my favorite part, and she did like I remember I thought like last time we saw her, how many of that, how much of that did she do? Like she must that was like twenty minute segment, right? What uh, the, the acoustic, acoustic segment? Bit. Yeah, it was it was yeah in it was the like middle. a it twenty was a minute segment. It was awesome. This time she did one tune, and so I just feel like the whole that was impressive. 
We'll get, we'll get to that in a second. But I feel like the whole two, the whole concert was just like stripped of all the organic elements and all the like real elements and acoustic elements. And of course, you guys are still sitting yelling at us, saying like, "Why did you go at all? Yeah. Why, what why do you, you like expect Perry? from a Katy Perry concert?" Well, the first time we went, we were pleasantly surprised. Right. And this last this last concert that we just went to, we were seeing looking at the audience, and they were also like sometimes just generally uninterested in what was happening. And for, like, a multi-billion dollar, probably, you know, production, it's it's weird that people looked bored during some parts. Okay, again, this is, like, okay, we were kind of far from the, the, the crowds of kids. Right. So I'm 37 years old, you're 37 years old, this could be way over our heads, and maybe people are digging this. Now... This was a ridiculous concert. It was stu- the the show they put on is stupendous. Like d- crazy costume changes, she would disappear into the floor. Right. You know, like like gigantic props would just appear out of nowhere. Yep. It, it, it it was insane. She'd be in the front of the house, and all of a sudden she'd be in the back yeah. of the house. The, like it was... the band was fantastic. There was a very cute moment where um, she said, "Anybody want to make a wish?" And um, she pulled up these two girls. And one of them proposed to the other one, and it was very cute. Yeah. And and it was just like you know there was a lot of nice little moments. Like there was one part uh, during this next bit here where she actually um, pulled up a dad from the audience to play her in one on one basketball. Yeah, but and they it, were like giant, like triple sized beach ball basketball. I, I like this because th- this was really cool. At at one part of the show, you see she's holding on to this thing. She's not wearing a harness. She was just over here. That looks like a good 20, 30 feet to me. Yeah. She basically held on to this one rope and it just pulled her up here. I'm like, yeah, she could die. She's going to dunk her in the basket, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. So there were a, a lot of great things and it was a great show. Um, and. The problem is, if I'd never seen the last show, I would think this was like the greatest thing ever. Right. But because I saw the last show, and I realized that all of the like rock elements have been oh, there. It is. There you go. But now it, I know for some people that doesn't, doesn't seem like a big deal to be able to do that uh, to hold on to a rope. But you understand something? I'm a big fat guy, so that's a huge deal to me. <laughs> I think that's very very impressive. And now you're doing camera moves. Yep. That's, oh, look what I did. Oh god. I don't need you anymore. That's the end of it. Uh, <laughs> Look out for the Jarrett Pressman show coming soon, coming at you. Um, Just one episode, yeah. and then I get to... This is too hard. I'm too, I'm too tired. Is there ice cream? So that that was really what it comes down to. Because the first time I saw her was so perfect and blew away all my expectations. Right. This time, because it wasn't quite as heavy. Like, basically, there were two guitar solos and t- like two times at night where they put the distortion pedal on. Like, it's okay to do that. <laughs> like, oh, there it is. Like, oh, they found the overdrive pedal. There it is. <laughs> Um, it was that one note where they found Solid Snake, you said? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the band was awesome. Everybody highly competent. The the background singers were amazing. And not for nothing, Katie sang great. Right. The whole show, she sang phenomenally. And, of so, course, the most important thing that happened during the entire show. Oh, yeah. Good. Hang on. Yeah. Is it here? Girls here go, jumping, jumping on, on trampolines. trampolines. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just take a second here. There's no yeah. sound. I don't even remember what song this was. It doesn't really matter. Yep. There it is. (laughs) There's a bunch of neon butts. (laughs) Oh, man. Why you... Okay. (laughs) Oh, you just... Okay, whatever. (laughs) So, uh, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I no I like again I thoroughly enjoyed myself. It's it's great to go see something like that live, and like I said, I'm. Maybe it's the musical theater nerd in me, but just when I see like high production value like that, like flawlessly done, I think it's just so impressive. Um, but I will say, compared to the last time that we went, this was a little bit of a letdown. It was a little meh. It was a little uh, musically, meh. musically, not visually. Not, it was still as stunning as the last one. Um, musically, not performance wise, mind you. It was right. Like that's what, what I got to stress here. Like everybody played their parts perfectly and sang, and Katie sang great. It was just the um, stylistic choice to make everything like 80s synth pop. Right. Even songs that, you know, weren't. Right. You know, like songs that had like, like, like you know, um, like I Kissed a Girl and, and, and Hot and Cold, which are basically rock tunes. Right. You know what I mean? Like, But they just had like a, it, I mean, they literally sounded like you, you could have just put a Casio keyboard like, you know, dance. Just weird, on. yeah, was, weird it, like, aesthetic musical direction. That's the thing that I, that that I didn't prefer this time. But um, in, in terms of putting on a show, fantastic. Right. 
gr- like spectacles, crazy things. I, what I would love to know is how it's all synchronized. Because another thing I noticed was the guitar players didn't have pedals on the floor. Right. They were just like, you know, they, they just had their guitars and all their sounds were being changed. So my question is, like, do they have, like, is there, like, a, a master clock that goes that everything is synchronized to? Because, like, you know, everything down to this video screen, to the lights, to, like, the smoke machines, the confetti machines, right. um, her bra. Um, <laughs> it, you, he's not, it's, it's, that's not even a joke. It's true. You know, the... Props, the guitar sounds, the keyboard sounds, the loops being triggered, right. the montages. It's like everything was like super synchronized and, and like the lasers and it's just like Yeah. And I, I was watching it like this is crazy. Like the amount of like money this takes and also just the amount of artistry it takes and teamwork it takes to put on a show like this really impressed me. Right. So if you can go see it, it, all right, if you're like me and you're mostly a classic rock guy um, and you sort of like some pop act, go. Because it's not what you're used to seeing. Especially if you're like me, where like the biggest show you ever saw was the Eagles, which is basically like, yeah, it's in an arena, but it's you know it's six guys just standing there strumming guitars right. and not moving. Um, yeah, it's great, and you know obviously I like the Eagles better, but if you have the opportunity to go see a big pop production, it's nuts. It's nuts. And this was almost as loud as Motorhead. You could, yeah, <laughs> and you could, uh, you could, you know, do it on the, do it on the DL, you know, take your daughter or your niece and quietly creep in the corner and just enjoy yourself, <laughs> or just look like creeps, like me and Jared did last night, like we were on some sort of list somewhere that. <laughs> Hashtag Megan's Law. <laughs> oh God! All right, so I think uh, I think we've covered it all. <laughs> if you haven't turned it off already, thank you. What concert would you like to see next? Oh man, um, I don't know. Um, you, you and Anne Marie both hate Megan Trainer, but I, I like her. Hate's a strong word. <laughs> you dislike Megan Trainer. No, I wouldn't go out of my way to see Megan Trainer. Let's put it like that. It depends. I, I mean, it's it, like it's, like we've been saying. Like, if you have the opportunity to go see it, you know, going to concerts is a financial, uh, uh you know, uh, obligation. So sometimes it, it you can't. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to pick and choose sometimes. I haven't seen a Broadway musical in like five years cause they're too damned expensive. Uh, if, uh, if uh, I have two, um, if Genesis gets back together, I got to get on that cause sure. I, I stupidly like say, eh, I don't want to go next last time. And I can kick myself for that. And pink. I want to go see pink. I would see pink. I'd maybe want to see Barry one time before he calls it quits. Um, Yeah. All right, so there you go. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.